like to thank AIOC for their AIOS, AIOS for giving us the UVA group uh, the, um, uh, uh, the opportunity to hold the national symposium of the UVA. The title of the symposium is the UVA is Diagnosis and Management, Current Updates and Newer Modality. I am uh, Chair uh, Dr. Jyotima Biswas, Co-Chair is Professor Vishali Gupta, Convener is Dr. Amit Khosla, Co-Convener is Dr. Deepankar Dash, Moderator Dr. Jyotinder Singh Bhalla, I don't know whether he is here or not, Dr. Sudarshan. Uh, panel discussion is Dr. Amit Khosla, Dr. Deepankar Dash, Dr. Natasha Radhakrishnan, Dr. S. Bala Murugan. So, I would like to uh, request uh, co convener Dr. Amit Khosla to start the session in time. We have got time till 11.55, one hour 25 minutes. Good morning everybody. We start with the first talk, clinical presentation, how they have changed since the COVID area, uh, era, Dr. Padma Malvi Mahindra. Respected chapters and dear friends, very good morning to all of you. I'll be talking to you on regarding clinical presentations, how they have changed since the COVID-19 era. During the COVID-19, we followed the advice where most of the immunosuppressions were have restricted use. We were not going up with iron immunosuppression, resulting in flare-up of uveitis. What we have seen is Following COVID, we have seen varied manifestations in addition to the activation of uveitis, there were vascular occlusions. In our study, we found that in addition to the routine laboratory investigations, we also noticed increased D-dimer, serum ferritin, LDH, and raised inflammatory markers such as ESR and CRP. In this, serum D-dimer and ferritin levels were significantly elevated patients with vision-threatening ocular manifestations. In addition to that, we also have varied ocular manifestations following COVID-19 vaccination, varies from anterior to pan-uveitis. In our cohort, herpetic uveitis was the commonest among the infectious uveitis. The reactivation of HLA B27 among the non-infectious uveitis. We'll see case examples. Here is a 14-year-old girl, known case of bilateral intermediate uveitis. She had inadequate response with systemic immunosuppressive therapy with MMR or methotrexate and tacrolimus. All these drugs did not work well. Finally, we have to shift her to a biologics injection adalimumab with methotrexate, following which she started showing resolving inflammation by then the pandemic hit. So this is a picture where we could see the resolving inflammation. Patient lost for follow-up for four months due to the pandemic. She presented with flare-up of inflammation. So adalimumab dose was increased to 40 milligram once in two weeks. We started noticing resolving inflammation. Subsequently, the patient had fever, suspected to have a COVID-19 infection, following which systemic immunosuppressive therapy adalimumab was stopped. And subsequently, when she came for follow-up, there was flare-up of inflammation. Then we restarted the adalimumab. However, we did not find adequate response with injection adalimumab following COVID. So we shifted this child to tofacitinumab, jacinase inhibitor. Started responding to treatment. Then the child developed super added skin fungal infection. At this time, we could see the flare up of ocular inflammation with change in the morphology of snowball opacities. We added systemic antifungal with continuation of anti-inflammatory therapy, following which we could see the resolving inflammation with changing in the morphology of the snowball opacity. The story does not end. After two months, the child goes and takes the COVID vaccination in the school, and following which there was mild flare-up of inflammation. We 
topped up with systemic steroids, the inflammation started responding. We, now the child is doing well. So here, this is a immune-mediated uveitis, had a flare-up of inflammation following COVID, and subsequently have to put on jackkinase inhibitors with superadder fungal infection. Again, the child had vaccine flare-up. So changing morphology from non-infectious to superadder infective infections with vaccine flare-up in this case. Next, we'll see the second case. It's a 19-year-old lady, a known case of JAA on methotrexate presented with chronic anterior uveitis, and also she had subclinical retinal vasculitis with macular edema. Her inflammation resolved after adding injection adalumumab along with methotrexate. She was inflammation free for six months. Then she took COVID vaccine. She took Covaxin. Complaints of new flow tests in both eyes. The flow test developed first dose in one eye and then it started seeing it in the other eye as well, supposed to be the normal eye. FFA showed diffuse perivascular leak in both eyes, right eye more than the left eye. Superadder infective etiology was ruled out. We treated with topical difluoropredinate with continuation of injection adalumumab with methotrexate. Subsequently, the inflammation was resolving and finally it settled down with this treatment. The next case is a 56-year-old lady, known case of rheumatoid arthritis on methotrexate, presented with pain, redness and blurring of vision. She developed herpes zoster ophthalmicus six weeks following COVID shield vaccination. Initially, she had fever after the vaccination that was managed with antipyretics. Six weeks later, herpes zoster ophthalmicus with viral anterior uveitis responded well to topical and systemic antiviral therapy along with topical steroids. So we have seen most of viral herpes zoster following COVID vaccination in our patient. The next 20 year male known case of Bechet's disease with retinal vasculitis on treatment with azathioprine 150 milligram per day. He was treated with oral azathioprine, entered remission, maintained the regular immunosuppressive therapy during the pandemic and he had an uneven, uneven full course with no relapse in spite of receiving COVID vaccination. Next case is a 29-year-old lady, chronic VKH, had resolving inflammation. She's on azathioprine, cyclosporine, and prednisolone in the pre-pandemic period. So this is a picture of a fundus. She lost for follow-up, presented with flare-up of inflammation, she was treated with top-up of increasing the dose of systemic steroids with continuation of systemic immunosuppressive therapy. She lost again for follow-up for eight months due to her pregnancy. She stopped all the medications on her own because of her pregnancy and presented with flare-up of inflammation with worsening of visual acuity. Subsequently, this was controlled with additional systemic steroids and immunosuppressive therapy was restarted. In spite of immunosuppressive therapy, there was persistence of inflammation in her. On top, she took the COVID shield vaccination. She had flare-up of inflammation. This is a post-vaccination. We could see the presence of iris nodules and they responded to systemic therapy, steroid therapy. Adalimama was added in addition to the azathioprine and cyclosporine. In spite of adalimama, she had persistence of inflammation. Finally, we have to start uh, on injection golimumab monthly once dose, and subsequently, she responded well to the treatment. So the next case is a 73-year-old lady presented with pan uveitis, probably of sarcoidosis, responding to methotrexate. She had angle closure for which she underwent yak peripheral iridotomy, and she had a macular edema for which topical difluoropredinate was given to her. Patient lasts for follow-up for 13 months due to the pandemic. She was in the village. She stopped all the systemic immunosuppressive therapy. Flare-up on and off, she started using difluoropredinate on her own 
Subsequently, she presented with increase in intraocular pressure and optic nerve damage in the right eye. These are the challenges we faced because they were not able to continue the systemic immunosuppressive therapy. Self-medication resulted in secondary complications following uveitis. Necessity is a mother of all improvisation. If you ask pre-pandemic, we say teleconsultation, uveitis is no. But in COVID lockdown time, teleconsultation, with that we have a viable options, monitor the treatment or continue the treatment in chronic uveit cases. To conclude, non-infective uveitis with flare-up of inflammation with aggressive course was seen following COVID and also following COVID-19 vaccination. We had lot of superadded infections, both viral and fungal following COVID infection. And we also had vaccine triggered inflammation with varied manifestations, but most of them responded well to topical or systemic corticosteroids therapy. Risk teleconsultation played a role in monitoring the response to treatment during lockdown period in COVID-19 infection. I would like to acknowledge the team members. Thank you for your attention. I take this opportunity to invite you all for UCCon 2023. This beauty is going to be in Abu Dhabi with lot of academic feast and also <coughs> sightseeing. So exciting program is awaited for all of you. We look forward to seeing you in Abu Dhabi. Thank you for your attention. Any comments from the panel? So the COVID has uh, really taught many things and improvised uh, many things. Uh, I could uh, manage the scleritis cases um, in the COVID, but uh, posterior uveitis and other things in the teleconsultation was very um, limited and limited value unless we have the whole history. So the teleconsultation has got its own limitations in the COVID area, but we could help some patients during teleconsultations regularly over the run. And COVID vaccinations, we have seen many uh, uh, uveitic pattern, like, you know, all the variants, BKH, uh, scleritis, um, anterior uveitis, non-granulomatous type. So I don't know what the others have experienced. I have a question for the panel. So we get a lot of patients who like to attribute flare-up of inflammation or even pre-existing inflammation to COVID. And they ask a question, is it related to vaccine, my inflammation? How do you address this question and uh, what is your best response? Uh, and the second question I'll just ask along with it, that ma'am showed some cases where the ad response to adalimumab was probably not as adequate. So did you notice uh, any difference in the response to adalimumab before and after the pandemic? Mike. Subset of population who had an aggressive course following COVID infection, they did not respond to the same immunosuppressive or biologics like adalimumab. For example, the wheat age lady, she had a severe course. She stopped it in between. When we restarted, we did not get the response. Finally, we have to put her on golimumab to control the inflammation. We did see effective course. Dr. Pradma, I wanted to ask you, have you seen reinfection of uh, COVID infection? Uh, uh, involvement in these cases, whether the uveitis is much more in those scenario, and what is important is that you know, for adalimumab to start with, you no, know, we have to pay attention to the optic nerve. If there is a mild paleness or a pallor is anticipated, better to uh, avoid adalimumab and put other medication. Any please. comment, please? Uh, I have a. See, you, I have a lady that put her on rheumatoid arthritis who developed herpes zoster of Palmicus. She had a vaccine triggered and subsequently she had a secondary infection following which she had a flare up of herpes zoster anterior uveitis, not the zoster as such, the viral uveitis flared up and it persisted for longer duration of time. So uh, going on the next, if you have herpes zoster in a non-infective uveitis, how long should one stop the immunosuppressive? One week, two weeks, or should two weeks is the standard. Normally, stop 
or sometimes in severe, it depends upon the etiology of the underlying autoimmune disease. Sometimes if it's life threatening, we stop it, we stop it for about a week and then restart, but the common norm was the so two weeks. So you will treat for two weeks of uh, antiviral or much more? Would you give a prophylaxis if the patient is on methotrexate, would like to give antiviral yes. for yes. a year or so? Yes, prophylaxis for longer time. Also, acute, we treat them with full dose of oral acyclovir. 10 to 14 days course if the patient is on immunosuppression and then maintain with oral acyclovir if the patient on underlying system immunosuppressive So you give the disease. 400 yeah, this BD particular for lady received 400 mg BD for longer duration. The second thing I, f I found with ADA is that if a patient stops ADA, the uveitis comes with the bang and you need to treat much more aggressively. It takes much more time and the second round you start ADA. And unfortunately, ADA doesn't cause remission of the disease. So if you've been there for more than a year or two, you develop antibodies, then I think the Golimab is the best option to switch, then come back later back to ADA. So because Golimab is so expensive, most of our patients cannot afford. See, and we tried with it, but in spite of an optimum dose of steroids and ADA, patient did not respond and end up switching to Golimab. So I have one patient of JI who is stopped ADA three times and every time the child stops ADA comes back with the more severe uveitis it takes more months to control the we have a talk on biologicals coming up by Dr. Kalpana so probably like these are the questions that can be answered there like Partho has a question on COVID I, I, I just want to highlight that uh, if you see the literature that all entities after COVID vaccine have been reported in the literature I think it's a high time we should analyze them with the Naranjo scale our editors should be more careful on, I mean, accepting those manuscripts with the, uh, in the light of uh, this Naranjo skills, which has not been applied in most of the published literature. Exactly. I mean, uh, that, that was what I wanted to ask, ma'am, Dr. Vashali. So, uh, are we seeing, uh, I feel we are seeing more of herpes, more of uvl effusion kind of syndromes, weak age reactivating or new weak age coming at 60, 70 years. Like, uh, you know, with 80% of the population being vaccinated, it would be very difficult to say what is being caused by the vaccine what is the you know happening so that is why when we are talking about the published they are at best the case reports are small center series nobody is able to come up with a large series because no big journal is taking this theory that they are activated by virus okay. so unless we have a real solid evidence to propose the relationship i think it will be very difficult because, yeah, as Path was telling, like, we, we don't know whether it is the cause-effect uh, cause relationship. No, it's just the clinical mm. patient receives vaccines, shows up 10 days later or five days later, but we really have no way of showing that vaccine caused. Probably, does it, is it that the vaccine has triggered or modified the immune it system? It might and then have triggered, but till the time somebody the actually immune system, finds no. that mechanism, the large publications in a high-impact journal like I know ophthalmology rejected two of these straight away, mm -hmm. just saying it is just conjunctural. We do mm -hmm. not know. Because we've always been taught as uh, students that 15 to 45, 50 years is UV, it is beyond that you'll always think of something else. In the, but the elderly, you get even the young man's disease. No, it is causing some immune mechanisms. I'm not saying it's not causing. Only thing is we have to work harder and prove the pathogenesis. Thank you. Don't think that there any more I have reviewed so many papers on the COVID vaccinations following that inflammation. I think is uh, many of the things I have just rejected. Okay. Any doctor has herpes zoster gone up after uh, COVID because I've seen a huge rise in COVID, uh, in herpes zoster at least. We haven't seen a huge rise, but we have seen few atypical cases which are very aggressive, which behave very differently. But I do have not seen a very huge rise. There are know? reports of herpes being on yeah. the rise uh, after post-COVID. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can we ask Dr. Manisha to come on stage? For the sound working. OK, move the next one. So we'll, next topic. And next one is uh, Dr. Manisha Agrawal, and she will be, uh, she's here. Manisha is uh, going to talk on what is in a name, newer nomenclature and criteria in UVITIS. She was here. Okay. 
Manisha is not here. Next, you go to uh, Dr. Anuruddha Agarwal, who is an authority on uh, ocular imaging. In, uh, ocular imaging, you will be talking on imaging techniques. What's hot and what's not? Anuruddha, please. Very good morning, uh, and thank you um, for this opportunity. So, I'm going to be focusing on imaging of the choroid in non-infectious uveitis, um, and we'll see what is hot and what is not. So. When it comes to imaging the choroid, we know that we have many lesions which we encounter in clinical practice and we need to characterize them using imaging. So uh, whether you have a good clinical description or not, the imaging becomes very important when you have lesions, especially when you can't see the whole lesion itself, especially when it's deep in the choroid. Now let's look at this example. So you have a patient with a yellow lesion in the superotemporal periphery and you need to look at it more. Now, if you do the fluorescein angiography, often it's not very contributory. You will find some hyperfluorescence, which increases, but again, you don't really know the characteristic of the disease. So this is when we need to define a phenotype and we need to understand how it is different from the lesions which require active treatment. So this is a patient with multifocal choroiditis, but this is, this is a patient, I'm sorry, of unifocal choroiditis of a tubercle where you have a single, or it could be multiple, small discrete lesions with a central core. And usually when you see them, they are inactive because the patient has already had disseminated TB and the lesion itself is quite inactive. But we are concerned about multifocal choroiditis, which we more often see in our clinical practice, which has a phenotype that could be confused with MPE and other multifocal choroiditis garden variety. And this is where, again, the choroidal imaging plays a role. So let's look at this patient and this patient, uh, looking at the fundus image, you can probably make out that there is fluid in the center of the left eye and you have a yellowish lesion just inferior to the macula, to the center. And look at the fluorescein here, it shows you hypo and then it, eventually the lesion is hyperfluorescent and you have pulling off the dye. So this is a classic example of a TB choroidal granuloma. And on the, on the fluorescein, when you have a lesion which is hypo to hyper, along with the accumulation of fluid, that is a very good clinical sign of TB choroidal granuloma. And often these come with intense neovascularization over the lesion. Neovascularization can be made out on the fluorescein by uh, looking at vessels which are dipping down into the lesion, or you may have preretinal hemorrhages, or you may even have intense hyperfluorescence, which you may not encounter in patients with sarcoidosis. So now this is another patient here who has lesions in the center. And you can see that there is hypo, uh, diffuse uh, sort of a geographic pattern of hypofluorescence. Uh, and you have a CME in the late phase along with disc hypofluorescence. The ICG shows you a central area of uh, hypofluorescence and which is more prominent in the late phase. But if you look at uh, the periphery and the mid periphery, you have some small diffusely distributed hypofluorescent lesions as well. Uh, looking at the OCT, you have subretinal fluid and you have bumping of the choroid. And to identify this bumped up choroid and focal thickening of the choroid becomes really important because this will lead you to the diagnosis. So this is a patient of sarcoidosis. And this patient, as you can see, has a limited amount of, uh, you know, the going back to the lesion, you will realize that the lesion has limited amount of yellowness inside the lesion. A TB lesion is generally more yellow, more bright, and associated with much larger volume of fluid, whereas this patient will have much less amount of fluid, and you'll have a less intense appearance, and this is true for a granuloma. So moving forward, looking at the imaging, you can possibly uh, lean towards a particular diagnosis. Now, when you talk about choroidal granulomas, TB granulomas, of course, can present with a a granuloma or a subretinal abscess, and subretinal abscesses are a form of TB where you have severe exudation, rapid necrosis, and destruction. Now, we did some work uh, uh, in PGI uh, differentiating TB versus sarcoid choroidal granulomas, and you can realize that with the EDI OCT, you can monitor these granulomas very well. So, an uh, EDI OCT passing through the granuloma can show you the entire extent, the anterior posterior as well as the lateral extent of the granuloma. So in this patient, you have a full thickness choroidal granuloma uh, in the right eye, and the CT chest gives you 
uh, calcified mediastinal nodes which are suggestive of sarcoidosis. So even the OCT looks very classic of sarcoid. You don't have the um, excess exudation or fluid accumulation that you would see in patients of TB. So when you um, use EDI OCT, you can monitor these granulomas on the EDI OCT. So when, when I'm faced with a patient who has either a posterior pole or a mid-peripheral yellow lesion, I think OCT is the first investigation that I like to do. So in this patient, as you can see, during the follow-up, the, the lesion has decreased in size. The anteroposterior extent decreases first and thereafter the lateral extent will decrease. So EDI OCT is very useful. Even if you don't have ICG, uh, you can monitor these lesions on EDI OCT itself. Now, uh, depending on the, sh on the OCT appearance, fundus appearance, you can sort of categorize and differentiate TB versus sarcoid granulomas. And for example, in this, uh, on this slide, you can see that uh, the, the location of granulomas are much more in the sarcoid granulomas are much more in the macular area, whereas TB granulomas could be perivascular or even extra macular. They could be in the mid periphery. Sarcoid granulomas will definitely involve the macula and they could have a widespread distribution. Again, as far as the color of the granuloma, I, I told you that the TB granulomas are definitely more intense yellow compared to the sarcoid granulomas. Uh, presence of subretinal fluid and really a lot of subretinal fluid goes in favor of TB and partial thickness involvement is more in favor of sarcoid. TB granulomas are usually a full thickness involvement. So moving on from uh, the TB and sarcoid, this is kind of stuck. So here, an important feature on the OCT that you can see differentiating TB and sarcoid is outer retinal infiltration. So here you can make out that in this patient you have some kind of an RPE sort of focal elevation and you have this outer retinal infiltration. This outer retinal infiltration is quite characteristic of TB. So you could use it as a clinical sign to differentiate TB versus sarcoid. Sarcoid granulomas do not have an outer retinal infiltration uh, and that could be a good clinical sign. Now using ICG, we have started to sort of binarize even ICG and we've had some talks uh, uh, in the um, AIOS about quantification and now we are beginning to quantify even ICG images. We have already quantified uh, OCT and Dr. Rupesh has done a lot of work on choroidal vascularity index and this could be very good quantitative measure to look at the response to your treatment. So the CVI uh, is uh, probably a better indicator compared to choroidal thickness, uh, looking at the, uh, the morphology of the lesion and the response to treatment. So this is available on the COIN network, which is the comprehensive ocular imaging network by Dr. Rupesh. Now, this is another picture here where you have a pa two patients. The top panel is a patient of choroidal granuloma and you see a single large granuloma, whereas the bottom image is that of a sarcoid granuloma. Now you realize that the patient with the large granuloma has in an intense yellow appearance, lot of fluid, and this is TB, whereas the second patient down below has these multiple granulomas which are small in size and these are more in favor of sarcoid. This is an OCT of sarcoid granuloma, so you can see it's a very well uh, behaved kind of a granuloma. It remains in the choroid. It doesn't cause that much of a choroidal elevation and there is minimum or no fluid associated with it. Uh, so I'll skip this. So uh, you can also use your ICG along with complement it with OCT angiography to identify white dot lesions or uh, the white dot spectrum. So this is a patient with a placoid lesion on the ICG and the OCT shows you a very characteristic ellipsoid zone disruption. There is a photoreceptor disruption also and this lesion, which is hypo to hypo on ICGA, is highly suggestive of MPE. And when you do an OCT angiography, you will have the exact co-localization of the fluid, uh, you know, the uh, flow void areas. So it very much matches the ICG. So MPE is a type of a choreocapillaritis with a confluent pattern. Now this is another patient who has blurriness and spots, and you can see multiple hypo lesions on ICG. And this is where doing an ICG becomes very important in practice especially when you're looking at posterior uveitis. So the ICG in the late phase shows you these multiple hypo lesions. And this is a classic case of mutes where the lesions are hypo to hypo, but they could also become, uh, they could also be iso in the initial phase. And the OCT is quite characteristic where you have this kind of an appearance of the outer retina with a disruption of the ellipsoid extending up to the outer nuclear layer. But remember here, the RPE is intact. This is 
uh, versus the MPE patients, here the RPE will be intact. And when you do an OCT angiography, you realize that there is no disruption of the choreo capillaries and there is nothing. So, uh, although you have these hypo lesions on ICG, you have nothing on the OCTA. Uh, this is my last patient with uh, scotoma and decreased vision in the right eye. And you see the contrasting appearance on two types of autofluorescence. One is the blue, fill, blue ray autofluorescence and the other one is the near infrared. And you realize that on blue uh, filter you have hypo auto, hyper autofluorescent and the lesions appear hypo on near infrared. And the moment you see this with no finding on OCT angio, you know that this is MUDES. And uh, the MUDES patients will have intact choreo capillaries. So uh, the goal of uh, my talk is to use these imaging modalities in a particular sequence and use a targeted imaging to see the pathology and then uh, narrow down your differential diagnosis. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a very nice uh, and exhaustive pr presentation, sir. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Natasha, uh, can you just, uh, for the benefit of uh, all of us, just summarize the basically, the, the, we always have this confusion between the TB uh, choroiditis and uh, the sarcoid one. Can you just briefly summarize, although Dr. Anruth has very nicely explained exhaustively. So from uh, what he has told us, uh, we can understand that the sarcoid granulomas will be uh, more in the macular area and most of them will uh, involve the macula. Other uh, TB will be uh, seen more in the mid periphery and sometimes perivascular. And uh, he has also told us that the, uh, the, the both these granulomas, when you image, you can see that they reduce in size first uh, vertically and then uh, yeah. horizontally. I think neovascularization. So that we need, uh, EDI imaging for that. Yeah. These beautiful EDI pictures actually are not available on most of our OCTs. The, uh, you really need high resolution imaging to make out that kind of difference. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's probably very difficult to just use imaging alone to differentiate the two. It That's can true. only be used as an adjuvant to whatever investigations that we are doing. I'd like to ask Anirudh, uh, we know that OCT, if you do an N-phase OCT for tuberculosis or sarcoid, okay, would it give a, because last previous uh, patient, there was a question uh, uh, was there for the N-phase OCT. And it was a very interestingly, whether it can give additional information, particularly to localize the RP changes for sarcoid and TB. I have not particularly used NFAS imaging to look at the RP or the choroid. I usually NFAS will be useful for uh, localizing the or the extent of choriocapillaritis. So often you may not be able to see much on fundus photographs, but you could use the NFAS imaging to look at the extent. But to look at deep choroid, I have not used NFAS imaging. There's a question, you, I think, in the back. It was a wonderful talk, very, Thank very you. lucidly explained. I think there's a question. Yeah, Nero, fantastic talk. Uh, just uh, wanted to ask you about the outer retinal infiltration which you were showing. Is it the same as the contact sign which we talk about in cases with a granuloma, a tuberculoma, or a sarcoid granuloma? Is this the same as one? And what is, my second question is that, what is your take on using pseudo-color imaging or a multicolor imaging in cases of uveitic entities, especially the non-infectious uveitis? The, the contact, this is probably the contact sign, but I'm not sure if we, we have the exact same pathology of uh, the contact sign and this outer retinal because the contact sign is more, uh, it is probably more full thickness compared to uh, uh, this, this kind of the infiltration that we are seeing. So I'm not sure if it's exactly the same pathogenesis. The second question I think is really important, pseudo color. We don't rely on pseudo color usually for uh, posterior uveitis. I'd like to have true color images Unfortunately, we, we, all of us, we don't have that much access to true color images anymore. We have to rely on optos or we have to rely on these pseudo color images. So that's where I think the clinical examination, I think has come back to being very important because we have, we have published it recently. You can miss an entire lesion, an entire choroiditis lesion on pseudo color imaging. So if you just depend on your col pseudo color, you may miss complete pathology. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
A very good morning to all of you and I apologize for missing from the hall when my name was called. So the talk for the day is what is in a name, newer nomenclature and criteria in uveitis. So let's first understand what exactly do we mean by a nomenclature. So nomenclature is basically a system of names or terms or the rules for forming these terms in a particular field of art or science. And apparently we all know that there are more than 30 uveitic diseases classified based on anatomical involvement and they have been basically broadly classified into anterior, intermediate, posterior and panuveitis or as infectious, autoimmune, eye limited and immune mediated. Now several clinical diagnostic criteria based on the sensitivity for uveitis is already there but there is absolutely no well-defined classification criteria based on specificity and the goal being to define a homogeneous group of patients of uveitis for inclusion in research studies and thereby minimizing the misclassification. So basically the aim is that we all talk on similar terms and thus the invention of the new classification criteria by Sun Working Group. So this is basically the second sun uh, standardization of the uveitis nomenclature for disease classification criteria and it was basically a project which proceeded in four phases involving informatics, case collection, case selection and machine learning. And this classification criteria uh, has been primarily developed for 25 uveitic entities. For some of the diseases, the new sun criteria is quite similar to the criteria which has been previously pr proposed but update has been done with newer information including virological criteria, immunologic, immunogenetic criteria and imaging criteria. The new classification criteria developed by the Sun Working Group seems to perform sufficiently well for use in clinical and translational research. Now we do have these 25 entities which have been classified by the SUN2 classification and you have them broadly classified still into anterior, intermediate, posterior and panuveitis. Now I will just briefly touch upon the major important uveitic entities which have a little difference to the previous classification such as the CMV anterior uveitis and there are certain clinical clues that we are all aware of. We can have poshness callsman like phenotype with or without CMV. We can have Fuchs versus Fuchs like CMV anterior uveitis with more endothelitis or endothelial cell loss, nodular endothelial lesions often coin shaped with a surrounding halo and a patchy iris atrophy and rarely heterochromia. CMV anterior uveitis versus uh, HZV or HSV uveitis where CMV has milder inflammation and low endothelial counts but nothing is a diagnostic phenotype of a CMV anterior uveitis. Now why is it important for us to diagnose CMV because we know that acyclovir may work on the other two viruses but not on CMV and if we diagnose CMV uh, then we know that the drug of choice would be gancyclovir which will help us not only in the control of inflammation but also is going to control the intraocular pressure and also will help in avoiding an endothelial cell count loss. So the Cree criteria which has been proposed by Sun is that it has to be a unilateral anterior uveitis with a positive aqueous humor PCR for CME and we need to understand that no typical clinical features can be reliably diagnosed as CMV anterior uveitis. We can also be having immunocompetent individuals unlike a CMV retinitis presenting with CMV anterior uveitis and this is the detailed criteria which has been proposed. Coming to Fuchs uveitic uh, syndrome, again if we have to differentiate, it will neither have endothelitis nor nodular or coin shaped endothelial lesions and this is an important feature to differentiate between the two entities. Coming to VKH, now it has been defined into two criteria as early stage VKH which includes an exudative RD with characteristic appearance on FFA or OCT, a panuveitis with more than two of the five neurological symptoms and signs and we can also have a late stage VKH including a history of early VKH and either sunset glow fundus or uh, two of the uveitis 
uh, uh, signs and more than one of the three cutaneous signs. So this is how it has been defined and what is important is that how do we differentiate it from sympathetic ophthalmia. So of course there will be no history of penetrating ocular trauma or a vitroretinal surgery prior to the onset of a VKH. And these are the detailed criteria which have been defined to differentiate between early stage and late stage VKH. And as I mentioned, if we have to differentiate because both of them are bilateral granulomatous uveitic entities, the most important would be the history of any kind of a trauma to the eye where we are going to be diagnosing it as sympathetic ophthalmia and not VKH. As far as the Bechet's disease is concerned, again, we have a lot of criteria which has been defined. And there is also an understanding that oral ulcers are very important for, uh, you know, diagnosing Bechet's disease using the IUSG criteria, plus any of the two following features such as genital ulcers, uveitis, typically defined skin lesion and a positive pathogy, pathogy test. The differences in SUN2 classification when we were to understand is that the hypopion uveitis, which was given a lot of importance to diagnose Bechet's disease, was not really considered relevant now as it was found in other entities such as HLA-B27 and endophthalmitis. And Bechet's disease was said to be primarily a clinical diagnosis and not dependent on the positivity of HLA-B51 as this has a high prevalence in general population where Bechet's is endemic. Its poor positive predictive value thus was not included in the new criteria. Coming to syphilitic uveitis, syphilitic uveitis can present as any anatomic class of uveitis and thus it is a differential for any uveitis presenting in your clinic. So we cannot really say that any particular ocular finding can be classified as syphilitic. Anterior and intermediate uveitis, a serological testing is very essential for diagnosing it as syphilitic uveitis. It can also present as posterior uveitis and pan uveitis and imaging shows the involvement of retina, RP or retinal vessels. So in a nutshell, anything or any, anything and everything can be a syphilitic uveitis and therefore it's extremely important with, that we do a, a treponemal test to really say it with definition or with a definitive diagnosis that we are dealing with syphilitic uveitis. Intermediate uveitis again has been defined into two as non pasprenitis type, also known as undifferentiated intermediate uveitis. And the, the CRE criteria for intermediate uveitis, non pasprenitis type, is a unilateral or a bilateral intermediate uveitis with having no snowballs in the vitreous humor, no snow banking on the pars plana. And other key exclusions include multiple sclerosis, sarcoidosis, and syphilis. So, this is the detailed classification, and I'm sure you can refer to the reference which I've outlined. Coming to toxoplasmic retinitis, again, it is a focal or a posifocal necrotizing retinitis and either positive PCR assay we get for toxoplasma from an intraocular specimen or we have the characteristic clinical picture of a round or a oval retinitis lesion proximal to a hyperpigmented or an atrophic chorioretinal scar. Pasplanitis, again, as I defined already, and uh, coming to tubercular uveitis, again, a lot of criteria has been defined. Now, the primary difference between uh, tubercular uveitis and between sarcoid uveitis, I think Anirud has beautifully differentiated between the two entities, which are very often confused uh, in our patients. So therefore, I would just conclude that this new SUN2 classification is basically an old wine in a new bottle. The classification criteria is primarily based on specificity, and this is basically with the aim to have minimal misclassification rate of uveitis, especially when we are doing research studies. Thank you so much for your patient listening. I have read all the Santu classification 21 uh, paper scheme. I don't use in practically in a case of VKH where is the bullous retinal detachment, subretinal safety in OCT, do a serological test for syphilis to rule out. So I don't know what others feel like, you know, the, uh, there are some certain uh, cases which is so clinically evident and theoretically you should not do that. Uh, that syphilis is a mimic and a mimic any kind of uveitis, I agree. But where the diagnosis is quite obvious, I... Yeah, I agree. I think Sun has very categorically time and again said this is not a diagnostic criteria. These are the classification criteria. Like if you want to report, you want to classify, 
you can base it on sun too because dr biswas and myself we were a part of sun too it is never meant to be a diagnostic criteria and it should not be applied to diagnose a patient uh, do the sun uh, two criteria uh, no included white dot syndrome because this is a very difficult to diagnose this thing uh, they have given white dot syndrome based on the data of the patients the problem which occurred in sun 2 was the images were very very variable so when they applied the data to machine learning they could not analyze the images so whatever the criteria has come up it is what experts felt you know so for white dots iusg is going to announce within next two weeks we are taking up as something sun 3 which is image based diagnostic criteria for five of the white dots that we have started so the initial brainstorming has been done very soon we will roll it out to the members so i would agree ma'am that uh, basically what uh, the sun 2 is that when we are doing any kind of research studies we all use the same terminology and classify the patients yeah. but you don't use this to make the diagnosis right i agree in the clinic it's not really required now can we have the uh, next speaker dr sudarshan sridharan and he is going to talk on algorithmic approach or artificial intelligence in diagnosis where are we dr sudarshan ki okay so good morning um thanks sir uh, jatinder dr somshila and as for the opportunity I'm kind of a different talk so i'll try to see how much i can do it if you can call it call them the traditional algorithmics so all those people who say that the naysayers if you want to call them the artificial intelligence for people with no brains of their own they say traditional approach is the best but then you want to call the other one the artificially intelligent ones so they say like don't live in the past like we feel old when they take all these gadgets and do so many things like they they feel machines can do everything artificial intelligence can solve everything but is there a middle path like algorithmic approach or artificial intelligence and especially new ages like where are we let's see like so like what literature has shown see for any any artificial intelligence in new ages or any kind of app for that like it has to be revolutionary it has to have an accurate diagnosis i mean even we are not 100% perfect but like we are trying to be close to it it, it uh, depends on human lives so differentials also have to be risk it shouldn't be wide off the mark it has to assess the risk and assess test with the treatment guidelines there have been many algorithms for diabetes crmd corneal uh, conditions but you it is are there that many because we are a different kind of people so we use our brains more compared to others that's why we want to boast up so we have a combination of signs and symptoms no other disease has so much where uh, you have a systemic and ocular features are such a big combination we have that great naming and meshing system we have just seen a diagnostic criteria for it so is it the best ophthalmic entity for ai model first of all we have to question whether a is good and then whether a is good for uvitis so there have been studies based on bayesian network and algorithm they have tried to study the uvitic etiology demographics and history so the match rate the match rate is how the ai algorithm matches with a very senior clinician so the most di likely diagnosis was seen in about 2/3 of these patients in their study so when they added the first two diagnoses then it became 80% great like then you are getting a differential then probably we are moving closer to it even the sensitivity and specificity range in all these were between 50 to 100% it's not that every other patient you can diagnose and every other patient you cannot you cannot misdiagnose that is not okay 50% but then like for some conditions like reactive arthritis sarcoid bashes they were very good but for some condition like tb they were very poor so we have to be cautious about this especially in endemic situations like ours so it is okay but it, are we fully there like, let's see so i tried to see a very popular fibrinous non granulomatous anterior uvitis in our app like the chat gpt seems to be doing anything and everything passing all the exams so we thought like uh, we'll see a 30 year old male fibrinous anterior uvitis what is the differential diagnosis so any of us probably would have started thinking in some other direction but it just gave gave a vague diagnosis of an acute anterior uvitis multiple sclerosis lyme disease aids so then i thought like somewhere we are missing then probably add this a systemic history of a back ache so when i tried this then ankylosing spondylitis was first in the list okay so it depends on how you ask the question and what especially you give in the information 
So then I thought I got uh, happy about it and then asked what to investigate. Then it's a, it gave all other investigations except HLA-B27. So it, is, it seems to diagnose, but it doesn't seem to help us in uh, management. Is that so? No. The answer is I learned it quickly, used all the keywords and used it with the nearest competitor, the barred one. Okay. So this, when you describe the question fully and clearly, he gave a diagnosis of a HLA-B27, ankylosing spondylitis is the diagnosis. So you can have a combination of AIs, which are, see one thing you should remember that these are chat G, chat bots. Okay, so these are not specific for UATIC entities or ophthalmology, but it, these are anyway in the same direction. So we had a pattern of an anti uveitis with a fibrinous uveitis. We had, I thought we'll try another pattern. See, all these are not image based ones, based on the questions. So there has been studies which have 2,000 slit lamp images they have tried. But 2,000, I don't know whether it's a number enough for UATIC uh, artificial intelligence. The accuracy, precision, recall, they're all between 0 0.6 to 0.9. So they tried to compare between the algorithm uh, of a Fuchs with the AI model and with an ophthalmology resident. An ophthalmology resident in their place poured badly. So I tried with my PG and uh, with the chatbot. And this showed that seventh was in the list for a description of a unilateral anterior uveitis with stellate keratic precipitates. I thought it was so easy. And that's what my PG said. She said spotter fuchs. So then I added what, what to treat. And it said in some cases, surgery may be required to remove keratic precipitates. I really panicked. So this is what sometimes happens. Like So you'll have to be very careful what you're doing. So like then I started adding uh, pigmented KPs. So we wanted white KPs scattered all over. Okay, fine. Like So we start thinking uh, viral and other things. So, but most probable diagnosis was posterior segment glaucoma. I know about posterior Schlossman uh, syndrome or PS, like I was trying to figure in what it was, but it didn't come into the picture. Okay, fine. But my PG said viral. So, I, it's not that I'm against artificial intelligence because I use these slides making office intelligence services. So, like I, when it matters, I really use intelligence of somebody else's. So, I don't know whether I'm boasting my PG's knowledge or all my teaching skills, but then <laughs> back, coming back to literature, we were trying to see if there are some AUC scores, how good they are. So you know that like if it is 0.5, the, like, I mean, uh, it's a no discrimination one. 0.8 to 0.9 or more than 0.9 are excellent and outstanding. So most of these studies have shown very good uh, results. See, the one important thing you should remember that if there is a study or a uh, model for a specific entity, they seem to be doing much better. So this was a study on Bechet's disease alone. So that score was 0.91. And when they added vitreitis as a variable, it became 0 0.92. So it, it means that it is doing better when there are much better. The trust score was also much better. So trust score was, uh, there was a study on a trust score and a fundus picture. The fund, so I thought like, let's try a fundus picture description. So we saw an anterior vitreitis, we saw a fundus picture. This was perfect. Cytomegalovirus retinitis was the first diagnosis. I actually Google image the match this also and it came out as CMV retinitis. Mm -hmm. Probably it is one to pick, taken up from one of the publications. So, but then so I saw one diagnosis as hypertensive retinopathy. I asked somebody else without mentioning HIV. They said, yeah, it looks like STBRVO. I said, okay, fine. Like it, it seems to think similarly. And our own favorite, I asked a multifocal choroiditis with the serpogenous, serpogenous like all the combinations and then it showed tuberculous choroiditis. So it seems to be passing all exams. It has passed our COTS contest also. So we saw anterior vitis, we saw fundus. Then how does it fare if you get it together? This was a patient uh, with had anterior lesions and posterior lesions. So I, I wrote a question of a 50-year-old patient with sclerokeratitis, HIV positive, all that. But there are so many non-infectious and uh, uh, other conditions as the DD. So I thought there is something wrong. So I removed the sclera because sclera was not actually in what the sclera get. Then all these trauma, dietary, non-infectious went away. So we got the list of tests which were quite okay. With all the combinations and uh, permutations, finally came to a diagnosis of uh, infectious set. So I think that most of these AI plans are all made outside India, Western studies. So maybe sarcoid patients won't sneak in if it is made for that endemic country. So what did the other one say? Even that was okay with the DD. So based on that, it is not just based on that, like, okay, with the support of that also, we did the investigation and it turned out to be syphilitic. So this is what happened. And this patient uh, recently, last month, something like that I've seen. So AI models have been good in diabetes and corneal conditions. So they're, they're all image generated modules. In diabetic retinopathy, we, don't, we have a conglomeration of signs for diabetic retinopathy, not for 
diagnosing whether it is a diabetic or not. So we have a problem which are very similar signs and symptoms. We saw Anil telling about imaging and other things to decide about TBS circuit which looks so similar. When you have such kind of a combination, then you, you are stuck. Corneal conditions are more spotters, but then you you may have problems de deciding the layer of cornea involved. Maybe image-based studies are required. So how does our other apps, the last few slides. So I guess that's for another talk. So let's not become artificially intelligent ophthalmologists society instead of AS. So it's, we saw how good it is in UV it is. So I thought, how is it otherwise? <laughs> so we will all know in the GBM tonight. <laughs> So we were for for some fun like we go. We, I thought like where do you get button samosa in Chennai? Okay, Saravana Bhavan like okay. People who know Chennai know that it is a purely vegetarian restaurant. Okay, so I guess it's like blasphemous. So the case story case seems to be the risk nowadays. I'm not talking about any other case up north or up down. Karnataka results not that K also again. Is the Kochi story about artificial intelligence? Are we there? Yes, definitely not yet, but we are probably partly there on the, looks like we'll reach there. Will it replace us? Yeah, hopefully after our retirement, like not now. So artificial intelligence will always need uh, human intelligence. So if you make it well, then it will be your slave. It depends on how good you are. So I just wanted to try like asking whether, give me a picture of CMV red night. It's quite an honest one, you know, like it said, like I'm not able to generate images. I am just a language model. So remember that, like, okay, honesty is also there with, uh, so AI algorithms have to be inclusive, region disease specific, endemic is most important. It should not be totally dependent on the keywords. So ask the right question and ask it rightly. That's the most important one. We need like large data, obviously cross validation, biomarkers are important. Like, I mean, as every other last summary statement, collaborative research. Thank you. So, we welcome you all from SN last slide. Can I make we a have a macular comment? surgery. Uh, can I ask one small question? One small question can I ask? Oh, one small question can I ask? No, you'll have to have a big question. That's what artificial intelligence says. <laughs> Actually, it's a, what happened until and unless we feed something. Come again? Until and unless we feed something to a chatbot like AI, it cannot answer. We have to feed fast. Okay. So uh, I think the main problem is going uh, from Google days to now AI that uh, it is uh, day by day more difficult to treat patients. And they are more informed yeah, by yeah. us and the, that yeah, is the They factor. check that and then come. Back. Yeah, they uh, seem they to be thought that uh, this is the diagnosis and uh, we are thinking in other way. There's a bit of uh, confusion uh, how to clear the confusion. And, if, if some patient comes with this question, you can probably give the button some as example. <laughs> it's, uh, I find it a uh, little difficult nowadays. Yeah. Quite tough with the intelligence. already informed and uh, saying in another way by seeing the chat boot and uh, chat GPT answers. And uh, while ca coming to us, they are getting some other response and the treatment is delayed. They already know the treatment that is a little you know, we had a very interesting webinar today morning at 7.30 by Asia Pacific, Anirudh is here. We were presented a case, a case like Toxo, and then Anirudh did the image analysis and I made the diagnosis and then they asked Chad GBT. In 70% of the time, nearly, it gives the right diagnosis. And uh, we are publishing a paper based on the sun criteria that Manisha showed it was Dr. Biswas is a part of it. It was shown to the experts to make the diagnosis and chat GPT. I think 68% accuracy chat GPT gives the right diagnosis. Only thing is you have to be very careful the information that you are feeding because whatever you keep on feeding, it will keep on changing. And as you said, it's language based. It doesn't understand imaging as yet, but I think we are, will reach there. We'll go to the next topic. Okay. Next talk is newer IMTs and biologicals. It's a standard of care, Dr. Kalpana Babu. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I thank the scientific committee 
um, for this opportunity. So my focus today would be on biologics and is it the standard of care now? So as we just learned from the previous talks, um, non-infectious uveitis is a really broad label with varied etiologies and presentations. There are different diseases and causing uveitis. So we generally follow a conventional approach. We start them with corticosteroids, either local or systemic. And if you feel these require a longer duration or these uh, patients do not uh, tolerate this drug, we add conventional DMARDs. And if uh, this fails or if there are recurrences in spite of conventional DMARDs, the trend is to add another DMARD or um, uh, continue the same DMARD but supplementing local therapy. However, if uh, the steroids need to be given for a very long time, even at dosages which are less than 5 mg, or if there is a, a threat to the structural integrity, then we normally switch them to biologics or alkylating agents. But the recent trend has been that we shift them to biologics, and I'll tell you why, after a failure of a conventional demand. Now, each time a patient has a recurrence, there is some amount of irreversible damage which occurs. And generally, it is at this time we add a local therapy at uh, this particular recurrence. But what happens is the damage is already irreversible. So when such series keep happening over time, there is definitely a decline in visual output outcome. And also studies like the site study have shown that the single agent is usually only 50% effective by one year. And in only about 8 to 18% of the cases, you have really been able to take them off uh, steroids. So there is some damage which is happening very slowly, and you will be able to assess the outcome only very uh, later. So this is where biologics come in. So what, how is it different? So we are understanding the disease much better these days, especially in certain diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, MS, psoriasis, Crohn's. We know the inflammatory pathway. So the present trend is to target uh, this inflammatory pathway, and you target certain components of the inflammatory pa pathway, whether it is TNF-alpha or the inflammatory cytokines, the T cells or the B cells. A simple example is, say, if you take rheumatoid arthritis and scleritis because of rheumatoid arthritis. If it is a plain scleritis, you know it, the TNF-alpha is playing a role. But if there is a vasculitic component, then you know a B cell is playing the role. So it is easy to target therapy accordingly. And drugs are made using molecular recombinant DNA technology. This could be monoclonal antibodies. Generally, they have the suffix of MAB or they can be fusion proteins, cytokines, interferons, etc. Now, in India, this is becoming more popular these days because of the availability of biosimilars, which has reduced the cost to a significant extent. Just a picture to show how dramatic the response can be. This is one of our uh, rheumatology patients who also had ocular issues and the dramatic improvement with etanercept. So when do I use biologics in my practice? When there is a refractory ocular inflammation not responding, or there is a threat to global in uh, globe integrity or vision or life. However, in certain diseases like Bechet's and GIA, now it's becoming the first line of therapy. Now these are very powerful drugs, and generally it is best used in combination with a rheumatologist and a multidisciplinary approach. And you need to look extensively for malignancy, multiple sclerosis, and mainly infection in our scenario, which could be local or systemic. And we do a generalized uh, hemogram, liver enzymes, and renal function. And in my practice, we have found that a &E is very important, especially when you're trans, uh, using patients on TNF blockers. And it is very important to look at the socioeconomic status, because these modify the immune system so much that Infections is one of the common complications, and you have to adequately counsel these patients because many times our uveitis is idiopathic, you don't know, so you start off with a trial and error method of which biologic you're going to use. So you have to counsel these patients with infections. As we had seen earlier, sometimes these drugs do not work after some time, so you have to tell them about relapses. And after all these, especially in patients with idiopathic, sometimes there is no improvement and you'll have to switch drugs. So this is a broad list which is available in any journal, but I would be focusing on the drugs which we commonly use. And these include the TNF uh, blockers, the B cell blockers, then the interleukin inhibitors, 
and the new, the wonder drug, what we call as those drugs which target the signaling pathway, which are the Janus kinase inhibitors. So quickly into each drug, this is the anti-TNF alpha, because this is used very broadly because it's extensively studied and the efficacy is proved in many of these trials like visual one and two and psychomo. And these are the different types of uveitis which has been very, uh, it has been useful. And the drugs which we prefer is usually adlumab, mainly because of the convenience, we give it in a subcutaneous mode. Etanercept is a wrong drug if the patient has uveitis because this itself can cause uveitis. And infliximab is usually intravenous requiring hospital admission, so we use it as a second. But the problem with the anti-TNF agents are we do not know how long we need to give these drugs. Tuberculosis is a very important adverse uh, uh, infection which can occur, especially with infliximab. And of course, autoantibodies, which decrease the efficacy. So you see the adlumab working for some time, and then it stops working. And this is the time when you need to look at this drug, because there is a generation of autoantibodies. So you may have to switch the biologic. And of course, in patients who are ANA positive, the chances of drug-induced lupus is very high. So this is when there is a failure. You either look at the TNF levels, and you dose escalate to another TNF alpha agent or swap the biologic. But if there is a decreased TNF level, then you look for antibodies. And here is where we add a conventional uh, DMARD like methotrexid with uh, the TNF. This is an example of a HLA-B27 child who did not have any uveitis, was on etanercept, because etanercept works beautifully for the joints, but really bad for the eye, develops uh, episcleritis and uveitis, and then they had to switch it to adalumab. This is a patient with Bechet's. Again, when she came to me, she was this bad, and uh, oral steroids were continued on 30 mg for nearly about four years, and azathioprine, maximum doses of cyclo and colchicine and very poor vision with optic atrophy. You would not like to see something like this, but this is after 54 injections of adlumab. At least we've been able to reduce the dose to 7.5 of steroid and keep her on the same vision. The important drug, the next class is the B lymphocyte inhibitors, and the drug which we now use very commonly is rituximab. And this drug is really beautiful for ANCA-related diseases and even orbital diseases which are ANCA-negative. And we've also started using this drug in uh, multiple sclerosis-associated uveitis. But the problem with this drug is it depletes the B cell completely, so the chances of infection are very high. And it is important to look at, like you should be sure of your diagnosis before asking for rituximab, because once you give rituximab, it's very difficult to add another agent if this does not respond. Uh, at least in the next six months. So this is a patient with uh, orbital pseudotumor with scleritis, recurrent, refractory, in a patient with ANCA positive who has been given enough of cyclophosphamide and uh, to an extent of, you know, any more would lead to toxicity of the drug. So this patient was given rituximab and he's doing beautifully as of now. Um, this is another case of MS. So once we see retinal vasculitis with MS patches, the first line itself is multiple uh, is rituximab these days. So this is an improvement with that. However, one needs to remember that this comes with a caveat because there is a sudden depletion of the B cells, so there is an increase in inflammatory markers. So you can see paradoxical worsening of inflammation in, in about within a month of giving rituximab. So this is very important. This is a patient with SLE who developed a corneal melt after two weeks of rituximab. So another important class is the interleukin inhibitors, and especially the interleukin-6 inhibitors, especially the tocilizumab. And this has been useful for uveitic macular edemas and refractory GIAs. Uh, this is another important drug which played a very prominent role during COVID as well. And the Janice kinase inhibitors, the tofacitinib, because the cost has come extremely low. So uh, we're tending to use more of these small molecules in our practice. And Janice kinase has been very useful in uh, refractory and uh, anchor, you know, HLA-B27 related uveitis and even GIA, which I'll be showing you in these cases. So this is a child with intermediate uveitis, failed adlumab, and had cystoid macular edema recurrent. And this is after tocilizumab, you can see the dramatic improvement in the vascular leakages. This is a child with GIA and uh, who had failed conventional DMARDs and double DMARDs as well. 
and this is after tofacitimib, a dramatic response. But the problem is, this is a very strange, this is a, a patient with B27-related uveitis with an endophthalmitis like picture, maximum immunomodulation, and then they had to switch to tofacitimib to reduce the activity. And this is after tofacitimib. But the problem with tofacitinib is uh, the viral infections are on a rise with uh, tofacitinib, and one needs to be wary of that. And this is a very important complication which we are under uh, explain, I mean, uh, reporting. We see thrombotic episodes post Janase kinase inhibitors. This is one such case of AS who was switched therapy from adalimumab to tofacitinib, and you can see this uh, impending occlusion. And after stopping the drug, everything uh, improves. So um, just to uh, summarize the entire thing, we have come a long way in uveitic therapy, uh, from steroids to now biologics. But the importance is to work in a team. And uh, one, I would end with this slide of GIA. And these were complications which I used to see as a fellow 25 years ago. And this is the extreme left is a photo on conventional with conventional immunotherapy in JIA. And this uh, right slide is uh, with adalumab. And you started very early, and you were able to have such a good eye. I thank you all um, for the patient in, uh, hearing, and uh, welcome you all to Abu Dhabi uh, for our uh, annual USI meeting this year. Thank you. Kalpana, uh, have you used? Uh and biologics for intermediate uveitis, yes, chronic intermediate. The uh, problem with the intermediate, yeah, the problem with the intermediate uveitis is we do not know what is the pathogenesis, and so we start off with TNF alpha. Generally, they fail, uh, and we had to switch them to tocilizumab if they had macular edema. But the problem is in continuation because tocilizumab is very expensive. So I have about thirty patients of intermediate children. About 10 or an ADA, one third ADA in children. Mm. Majority are working fine. Children. They're stable, but you're not able to take off the vascular leakage mm. completely. Uh, no, I agree, but vision is 6 6. Yeah. yeah. So we are looking for a maintenance for 5 to 10 years. They're already on 5 6 years of. Yeah. Ma'am. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So usually when the patient comes already, they, uh, at least our rheumatologists, just, uh, they would have had a CT done. So uh, by and large, grossly, they would have done an uh, overall systemic examination and with a CT, uh, chest and abdomen. That's all what we do. But we do uh, uh, mainly infection profile, hepatitis related. No. I think one important thing is, Kalpana, beautiful talk. Uh, I don't think we can get rid of the peripheral vascular yeah, leak completely, and I don't think we should be using that, that as a, a parameter. If that vascular leak is not causing cystoid macular edema or disc edema, I think we, we can, can tolerate watch. that. And you showed beautifully, I 100% agree, like Manisha was doing a simple uh, IC on hypotony, in uveitis, and I don't remember seeing hypotony are all the complications of GIA now, because you have to intervene very early, with very aggressively, and then slow down, rather than first slowing down and then intervening when the complications happen. Yes. So I think that's a very important talk. I mean, if there is one one indication for tofacitinib or anything, then what? Tofestinib to me is only when the anti-TNF are not responding. Like I have used it very limited to children. They did well, but I think herpes activation is the major concern that our uh, you know, pediatricians have. Though it's cheaper, it's oral, it's easy, but it can't be used rampantly. So we had uh, anti-adilubimab antibodies positive. And for that, we shifted to tofistinib. And one, I think, on beristinib. They do well, but it can't be used as first line. It, it, will it be the next step? I mean, if somebody has an. Okay. Yeah. The 
этот You know, for that international trial, yeah, A.V. Ramanan stopped. is the one who's running. He was with us for a week. So he is recommending it, but our pediatric rheumatologists yeah. are still not convinced because of that herpes thing, yeah. And well, there well, are issues with the drug, Adelubimab is still the first need. drug of choice yeah. uh, okay. for us. I think we are, you were telling about Adelubimab antibodies, uh, too. So you, is there the, another option? Uh, as a research, not as a routine for patients. Not now, okay. Not changing into another biologic. Like no, no, no. Saying. You can. Like Adelubimab works, and then after a few months, you realize it's not working anymore. So it could be uh, people are using methotrexid along with Adelubimab instead of giving it as monotherapy because methotrexid apparently helps in reducing the mm, antibody production. But if the drug was working and is not working anymore, and you are very sure about the compliance because that could be number one reason that the patients are increasing the interval, missing the dosage. If you are very sure about the compliance, anti-drug antibody production could be the second cause. It's not commercially available but anything, but uh, we have been able to do it as a research. So if anti-drug antibody comes positive, you have a choice of shifting to rituximab, uh, you know, tocilizumab, or JAK inhibitors. So I don't have the experience enough to tell you, but I just two patients we shifted to JAK inhibitors. Children, they are doing fine. I, I asked this question to A.V. Ramanan, not for JAK inhibitors, but for biologics, biosimilars and biologics. And they have finished a trial where they found there was no difference in the yeah. efficacy between the original molecule and the biosimilars. But it, it is important, I think, you continue the same company drug, like Maybe. whichever biosimilar you're using, rather than shifting between biosimilars. So you, if you have an ADA resistance, you can go to Golimab. But that is not for children less than 40 kg, or you can go to infleximab and then come back after six months to add. We'll move to the next uh, talk. Invasive investigations in UVIH's diagnosis would be given by Dr. Mudit Tagi from LVPI Hyderabad. Dr. Mudit, please. This is the last talk. Okay, all right. So, first of all, good morning and thanks to the chair of this session and AIOS for giving us a chance of talking on the role of investigative investigations or invasive investigations in uveitis. Now, when do we need them? When do we need biopsies? We need them in cases where sometimes we are not clear. So this was, let me give you one example. This was one patient who was seropositive for HIV, also was a known case of abdominal tuberculosis, came with an exudative RD. This patient was already on ATT, but in spite of that, the lesions were not responding. This lesion was persisting and the exudative RD was increasing. There was also scleritis in this patient. So these cases, these atypical dilemmas, these problems, these masquerades, these conundrums, these are the ones where invasive investigations can come to our rescue. So like I said, when do we actually need biopsies? We need them in these cases. So this was one more case. This was a patient who had multiple lobulated scleral abscesses, discontinuous lesions, and areas of resolved scleral abscesses, but these patients came back with We took a biopsy, we did a scleral deroofing initially, and then after you have done that, you can easily go ahead and take a biopsy from these areas. And this biopsy can then be sent for microbiology. This was the pus that we got over here from this patient. The sample can be easily taken and then subsequently for a biopsy because this was a case which was having multiple recurrences, had initially been actually treated on lines of drug resistant tuberculosis. But what happened was that when we sent it for biopsy, the scraping which was there, that revealed presence of septate fungal filaments which were positive. This was actually a case which was secondary to a fungal infection over there. Started on antifungals and this patient did well. So like I said, cases of dilemmas when you do not get inadequate response to treatment, masquerades, endogenous endophthalmitis, these are scenarios where invasive investigations do come to our help. And what are the ones which we have at our disposal commonly? Taking a tap or a sample from the anterior chamber, vitreous biopsies, scleral deroofing, and if nothing else works, then a retinochoroidal biopsy in some of these cases. So this was one more case. This was a case which I had shown earlier in one of my other talks also. 
this was a patient who came with this blood stain hypopion when we took an ac tap as well as a peripheral blood smear what we got was myelomatocytes and metamyelocytes and this was a patient who was a case of cml so this was a blood dyscrasia where the ac tap as well as the peripheral smear revealed the presence of these band cells and these atypical cells which helped us in diagnosing this to be a case of a cml rather than a uveitis over here another case this was a lady who was a known case of non hodgkins lymphoma came with this retinitis lesion in the right eye and extensive vitritis and some retinitis lesion which could be seen underneath this this patient had a complete remission and the last cycle of chemotherapy had occurred 2 years back so now at this point of time what are the differentials it can either be an infection or it can be a lymphoma in this patient so we took a biopsy which came positive for hsv as well as cmv but was the cytology was negative for any lymphoma cells and what we had was a reactive inflammatory infiltrate so this was a patient which actually had a cmv retinitis was treated with oral valgain cyclovir the left eye was no pl to begin with but we could salvage the vision in the right eye which was maintained at 2020 subsequently another case this was a case which was initially thought of as a lymphoma you could see these multiple lesions over here patient had subretinal deposits but when we took a biopsy the biopsy came positive for multinuclear giant cells it was afb negative no lymphoma cells were diagnosed and this was actually a case of ocular sarcoidosis compared to that if you see this one patient you have see a patient with significant vitritis multiple yellow sub rp lesions optic nerve head infiltration and then you see this creamy yellow lesions though you know the clinically it looks like a lymphoma but a biopsy will help you confirm it and the ocd showed these sub rp infiltrates when he took a biopsy from this the biopsy basically came positive for isc was positive for cd20 this was a case of diffuse large cell lymphoma over here another patient again this patient turned out to be a lymphoma when we took a biopsy from this patient so what we need to remember the lymphomas can be a great masquerade and diagnostic biopsies are usually a gold standard at presentation 16 to 34% of them have cns involvement but why is it important otherwise also for us to diagnose them the reason is that 80% or more of these cases will ultimately go on to involve the cns compartment now one last case which will illustrate how biopsies can be helpful so this was a zero positive patient also had non hodgkins lymphoma now comes to us with inflammation in both eyes if you see this left eye this has got these keratic precipitates over here but when you look inside you see these areas of inferior temporal retinitis so this is a patient who has got retinitis in periphery is a known case of hiv also has a history of non hodgkins lymphoma and you can have either a viral retinitis or an arn or a toxoplasma which is presenting in an atypical manifestation so our differentials were either arn or acute atypical toxo or probably even a primary intraocular lymphoma because this patient is already a known case of non hodgkins lymphoma we took a biopsy which came positive for toxoplasma and when we started treating this patient with bactrim bs this is how the lesion started responding so the retinitis starts regressing and over a period of time this is how the lesion evolves we were able to salvage vision in the left eye which improved to 2080 and subsequently is maintained at 2080 and the lesions have completely regressed so the point in in these diagnostic dilemmas whenever you are suspecting masquerades when you see your patient are not responding to your treatment or the treatment is not progressing on the expected lines invasive investigations like biopsies do come to our rescue can and help us in achieving these diagnoses so take a good history suspect masquerades in atypical presentations or in cases where they are not responding to your treatment keep your mind open to the possibility of masquerades and go ahead with biopsies in the such cases so that's all from my end thank you so much and once again on behalf of everyone i would like to invite all the participants here for the next usi conference in abu dhabi thank you so much so with this we come to the end of the uh, national symposium on the uvia i like to thank iosc uh, ios to give us the opportunity to have this national symposium uvia is diagnosis and treatment current updates and new modality i like to thank my co chair dr bishali gupta convener dr amit khosla co convener dr dipankar dash moderator dr jyotinder singh bhalla dr sudarshan and panel discussion dr amit khosla dr dipankar das dr natasha radha krishnan dr balamurugan so all of them contributed quite nicely 
And I would like to thank the speakers who has brought out uh, the salient points in a short span of time and the audience for patient listening. Thank you very much. We'd like to meet you next year. Can we have the panelists and speakers for the group photograph?